My name is Mike Hamblin. I'm an attorney. I practice law in Michigan, and I have a uh, general business practice that includes helping nonprofits um, with various legal issues. Today's um, topic is going to be 10 ways to lose your tax exempt status. And um, this is a very important topic if you're working with nonprofits or have a nonprofit. There are a number of different ways that you can uh, sort of get tripped up when you're doing your administration work and wind up being in a position where you can lose your nonprofit exemption, your federal tax exemption. And a lot of these ways are uh, much easier than you might think. Some of them are inadvertent, maybe. Some of them can just kind of arise from maybe being careless or not being totally informed about what the requirements are. But once it happens, it puts you in a very difficult position. And so um, that's why we're going to go over this and hopefully give you some good information. The one thing that I want you to remember as we go through this, the, the point and the, my hope for this presentation is not that you're going to walk out of here and have uh, you know, the knowledge of tax law, which a lot of this is, to you know, run your own nonprofit from a tax standpoint. I'm going to just try to give you some basic issues to think about um, some things to think about so that when you go back to your place of work, you'll have some, uh, some elementary knowledge that you can use to sort of confront these issues. If you recognize any of these issues right now where you're sitting here and say, hey, that looks like something we're dealing with, the last thing I would want you to do or ever advise is to try to handle it yourself. What you want, if you recognize this either today or when you go back home, you say, oh, this reminds me of something we talked about in that seminar, the most important thing you can do is go get professional help. These are not things that you want to try to handle on your own. You want to find a tax professional, either a CPA or a tax attorney in your local jurisdiction. And I'll explain what I mean by that. If you're in California and you're having a nonprofit issue, you need to hire somebody who is either a licensed CPA or a licensed attorney in California because a lot of these issues, as we'll see, have federal tax aspects to them, but they also have state law aspects to them. Some of them, many of them do. And so if you hire somebody that isn't in, licensed in your state where you live or do business, you could run the risk that you're not going to get the best advice. Maybe they just don't know what your local requirements are and then you're gonna have even more problems. So um, what I'd like to do is I'm hoping that you'll get enough information that you can take this sort of spot issues and then if you think that you have an issue that you can go and hopefully use this to have an intelligent conversation with whoever is advising you to uh, resolve what's going on. And then the only other thing I'll say before I, I'll get into the presentation itself is there's, we had a little bit of a snafu. I had some outlines um, so that you could actually follow along with my PowerPoint presentation. Uh, for whatever reason, they haven't come through. But if you um, would like to have a copy of my outline, I'll be happy to get it to you either by email or mail or whatever is most convenient for you. So you can just let me know um, after the presentation. I'll take down your contact info and send you an outline uh, if you would like. So let's go ahead and get right into it. We've got a lot of ground to cover. So what I think I would uh, prefer to do is if you have a question, Maybe you could just note it, and then I'll try to leave some time at the end of the presentation to go over questions. Um, if we don't have enough time or there are too many questions, I'll commit to staying later and just uh, you know, having a word with you if that would work out. But I think for the flow of the presentation, it's probably best if we just wait till the end and then have all the questions at that point. So let's get into it. Um, here we have, the, the, often what I'm asked when I talk about this is, why is this important? I have a little nonprofit. The IRS doesn't care about me. Uh, why am I worried about this? And the answer is the IRS does care about you. There's no nonprofit that's too small to escape the scrutiny of the IRS. And they are the main organization that oversees the uh, compliance of nonprofits with the tax law and the tax code. And so in the United States, there are approximately 2 million exempt organizations. And it seems like a lot. 
Um, and it is, and every year 100 organizations, and I'm going to call them 501c3 organizations because that's, kind of, that's the most common nonprofit organization that you see registered under the tax code. Approximately 100 of those organizations lose their tax exempt status every year. And it's kind of like a, a lightning strike or a shark attack. You think, well, 100 out of 2 million, that's never going to happen to me. But if it happens to you, then it becomes important, and it can happen. Uh, depending on how you administer your uh, nonprofit. And the reason why it becomes so important is your loss of exemption can be deadly for your uh, nonprofit. If you lose your exemption, you're going to have to file some tax forms, but that's the least of your worries. The tax forms that you may have to file are regular corporate tax forms because the IRS is going to treat you as not being a for profit. Entity, they're going to consider you to be a for, uh, or a nonprofit entity. They're going to consider you to be a for-profit entity. So you may have to file a corporate income tax return, or if you're in a, a trust, you may have to file a different form for trust. But the worst part of it is you may have to pay penalties, excise taxes, income tax. It can add up very quickly. And even worse than that is if you lose your exemption, you're going to create problems for your donors. Because number one, it doesn't make for very good PR and your donor base if all of a sudden you've had your nonprofit status revoked by the IRS. It's very bad PR. And it can also uh, cause some practical problems for your donors that can create ill will because if your donor, um, well, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Let's. If you lose your tax exempt status, obviously you can't receive tax deductible donations. So that can make a hard uh, road for you. If you can't solicit tax deductible donations, maybe your donor base isn't going to be as willing to donate. Um, you're not going to be able to be identified in the IRS master file extract as able to receive uh, tax deductible contributions. So you're going to be publicly uh, identified as not being able to receive these sort of deductions or deductible contributions. And then you're not going to be able to be included in Publication 78, which is basically a list of all nonprofits that are able to receive tax deductible donations. You can then try to get your tax exempt status back, but that can be very difficult because you have to refile your original tax exempt application, which is called a Form 1023. And I don't know if anybody here has ever filled out one of those forms. I'm seeing somebody nod. If you've ever had to work on one of those forms, they're not easy. They're very time consuming. They're, it can be somewhat expensive to have a professional help you. It's kind of a pain in the neck. It's something you really only want to do once if you have to. Uh, you're going to have to refile that form and go through that process all over again. You can ask for retro rea retroactive reinstatement when you file your new application, um, but you know, you're still going to have to deal with the IRS and maybe you get it, maybe you don't. What I was alluding to earlier is with problems with your donor base, sometimes you may have a timing issue where somebody writes a check and sends it in thinking that they're going to get a tax deductible contribution and maybe you haven't been able to advise everybody that you're no longer able to accept them. So you're, you might have hard feelings if somebody sends in a check and thinks that they're getting a tax deduction and then later they're told they're not. It's just kind of bad PR. Um, and it doesn't matter if they're unaware, if your donor's unaware that you've had your exempt status revoked, they can claim a deduction only until the IRS publishes an announcement in its auto revocation list. So if they get it in before then, they can still claim a deduction, but if they get it in after it's been published, you're, they're not going to be able to claim a deduction. So again, why is this important? Basically, all, uh, charities and nonprofit organizations are coming under increased scrutiny by the IRS. And so from 2009, uh, or in the year 2009, they had a 30% increase in audits of charities and nonprofits. 2010, they had an, an additional 12% increase. So uh, it wasn't as big as 2009, but it's still a double-digit increase. And since 2008, the IRS has hired an additional 100 employees to handle these increases in audits. And I don't know if you've seen in the news lately about the, uh, the scandal with the IRS targeting certain organizations. 
you know, this administration, it targeted certain organizations. If you have a different administration and a different political party, different organizations get targeted. It's happened throughout the years. But the fact is, you always have to be vigilant about getting caught up in some of this stuff because they've increased staffing to, to uh, monitor charitable organizations, and that can spill over in a number of different areas. The bottom line is that the IRS has increased scrutiny of nonprofits. There's a lot of fraud out there. People set up nonprofits um, and then try to abuse it, and that's really what the IRS is trying to, to tackle. And so the increase in scrutiny is basically to try to prevent that sort of thing from happening. So there are certain areas that are being scrutinized more than others. And one of the areas that the IRS looks very closely at is your executive compensation and loans that are made to officers. So how much you pay your officers that are running the nonprofits comes under a lot of scrutiny by the IRS. They want to make sure that you're not enriching your officers or workers in a way that a for-profit corporation would do. They also want to make sure that you're paying sufficient employment taxes. Something that I don't think really uh, would be too much of a concern for us is consumer credit counseling agencies. You may have seen those on TV. They're proliferating as the economy continues to struggle. IRS is looking at those very closely. Organizations that may be relevant to the ASI group would be supporting organizations, and those are charities that typically collect and channel money to a specific nonprofit. And so maybe there are ministries in the ASI family that are supporting organizations. The IRS looks very closely at those kinds of organizations. And educational organizations also are uh, scrutinized very closely. We have, uh, in the US, we have a lot of for-profit education um, enterprises. And so the IRS wants to make sure that you aren't disguising a for-profit education enterprise in a nonprofit. So that's kind of the overview of why this is important and, and what can, uh, you know, kind of what the level of attention that the IRS is uh, paying to nonprofits. And again, the biggest mistake is to think, well, I'm a little nonprofit. No one's going to notice me out here. It's just not true. Some of the biggest legal fights that you read about in the legal journals start in, in very small organizations and very small issues and often they can snowball into something that uh, everybody's going to be reading about eventually. So the first thing, I've got 10 things to go over, really the most common ways that people lose their exempt status. So the first way is probably the simplest one, but it's the most common one and it never ceases to amaze me. The first one is your failure to file IRS Form 990. That's your annual tax return. So you would be surprised how many organizations either forget or just don't plan on filing their annual tax return. So uh, individuals, we have our 1040. Nonprofits have their 990. That's what you have to file. Even though you're not earning a profit, you still need to account for your income and expenses and other activities to the IRS on your Form 990. And so, again, you'd be surprised. We're going to look at some, at some uh, numbers here of how many organizations recently have not filed their 990. And um, it's a special circumstance when I'm going to show you, but it's still kind of amazing that so many people got into that jam. So Form 990 is due on the 15th day of the fifth month after your uh, taxable year ends. And here's the kicker. Failure to file your tax return three years in a row earns you an automatic exemption revocation. That's it. No questions asked. You don't file it for three years in a row, you're done. You're going to have to go back and start over. Now, here's the interesting number. In 2011, approximately 275,000 organizations in the U.S. had their tax-exempt status revoked for failing to file Form 990 for three ex uh, consecutive years. That's a large number. That's a, that's a crazy number that's not going to happen again, probably. But here's what happened. Um, prior to 2007, if you had, I think it was less than $50,000 in um, uh, income through your tax-exempt organization, you didn't have to file a Form 990. And then they changed the law, and now pretty much every nonprofit has to file this form. But a lot of smaller nonprofits apparently didn't get the word, didn't check in with their accountant. And so from 2008 through 2011, those three years, they didn't file their tax returns because they thought they didn't have to as in olden days. Well, around rolls 2011, 
and almost 300,000 organizations in the U.S. hadn't complied with the law for the last three years, and the IRS yanked their tax-exempt status. And uh, there wasn't any, um, you know, prior warning. They j it just is gone. You get that letter, and um, that's it. You're done. So you want to be very careful. Again, like I said, prior to 2007 or 2008, uh, if you had a very small nonprofit, you probably didn't have to file your return. But now, pretty much, it's now flip. Pretty much everybody has to file a return. And if you have a tax-exempt organization, you just need to plan on filing your return. The only ones that don't really have to file returns are churches and state institutions. Um, private foundations have to, regardless of how much money they bring in. And there are, I'll elaborate on some of the organizations that don't, but that don't have to file this. So if you have not received a tax exempt letter from the IRS, in other words, if you're not an official federally exempt organization, then you don't have to file a 990, but then you have other problems because you're supposed to be filing uh, for profit tax forms. Faith based organizations, you may see or talk to people that say, well, faith based organizations don't have to file tax returns. But that, again, that's more of a church. So that's pretty important to a group like ours because probably a lot of the nonprofits uh, that are ASI members are somewhat faith based in some aspect. But you don't want to uh, uh, um, think that you don't have to file your return because you're faith based. That, that, that exception really is for churches. So if you think you're getting close to a true religious or, or almost church type nonprofit, you and you don't want to file a tax return, you've got to consult with your tax professional, again, in your local jurisdiction, to make sure that you're uh, in the correct category for not having to file it. State institutions don't have to. This is one that also might apply to ASI members. Uh, subsidiary, subsidiary organizations that are covered under a group return filed by the parent organization. So if you're some sort of supporting uh, entity to a larger nonprofit, you may not have to file that return, but you again want to check before you make the decision not to. And so um, in, and I thought I was going to have handouts, so I apologize. This is a kind of a long um, web address that has more information. The IRS has actually a very helpful website for a lot of these issues, and that was an address that I was going to have in your handouts. Again, I can get that to you if you'd like to see that. It's um, too long there to repeat and kind of complicated and weird looking. Um, but the IRS has like a, a website and they have a section for charitable organizations and tax exempt organizations. It has a lot of good information. And so if you follow that link, you can get to a page that gives you more information on this. So I don't want to belabor this, but there are different kinds of tax forms that you fill out, different kinds of 990s. So for example, a 990 PF would be for a private foundation. A 990N is for really small nonprofits, and it's not even really considered a tax return by the IRS. It's something that you do online. It's called an e-postcard, and if you have uh, income of less than fifty thousand dollars, then you can file this, and it's real simple. It, I don't know. It might take 10, 15, 20 minutes to do it. It's not that complicated. Um, so that's they not, that group of nonprofits used to not have to file their return, but now you have to do the postcard. And then you have your 990 easy if you fall within a certain range of income and assets, as you can see. And then you have your regular 990 if you're over, if your income is equal or greater to 200,000 in each year and your assets are equal, uh, or your assets are equal or greater to 500,000. Now the other thing to remember is your 990, one reason why you want to be very careful when you're filling out this form is your 990 is a public document. So you have to provide this to any member of the public that requests it. And I don't know if anybody here has heard of the uh, organization called GuideStar. GuideStar maintains a database of 990s that are filed with the IRS. And so somebody can go to GuideStar as well and get your 990. So there's kind of an art to filling this out and that's one reason why you also want to have some help with your 990 because uh, sometimes watchdog groups will pull a 990 and they'll take certain stuff out of context and you know create trouble and uh, articles and newspapers get written. So you just want to be very aware of what you're putting in your 990 so that you um, make it a positive portrayal as positive of, as possible of your organization and the work that you're doing. And there can be a real art to making that story come through on your 990. So that's the first one and the most common one. 
The second thing we're going to talk about is engaging in what's called private inurement and private benefit. So private inurement is a tax term, and it basically means um, enrichment. Private enrichment of somebody who is connected to the tax-exempt organization and having benefits that should be going for public use, because that's what public charities are for, to benefit the public, having those benefits instead being diverted to an insider of the organization. That's really what private enormous is. So when an insider, someone who has significant influence or over the organization, enters into an arrangement with the nonprofit and receives benefits that are greater than he or she provides in return. This is a great way to lose your exemption because again, the IRS is on the hunt for organizations that are, have been set up to disguise private enrichment so that they don't have to pay taxes and they can sort of abuse the system they're very much on the lookout for this. So if you have an insider who gets a benefit greater than what they're giving to the, IRA, or to the exempt organization, you may have a, what's, what's called a private inurement problem. The thing to remember is private inurement is prohibited in all nonprofits, regardless of the kind of nonprofit that they are, and it's also an absolute term. There's no what they call de minimis exception. Any little amount of private inurement that flows to an insider is going to be grounds to have your exemption revoked. And it also, it also uh, applies to disqualified people who may not be currently involved in a nonprofit, but any disqual uh, disqualified person is any person who in the five years prior to the transaction was in a position to exercise substantial influence over the organization's affairs. So a disqualified person can be high-level managers, board members, founders, major donors, high, highest paid employees, family members of any of these people, and businesses where the listed uh, persons own more than 35% of an interest. And so you have to look back five years and you have to examine whether you're giving somebody a private benefit through the nonprofit. And I'm talking about a benefit that's other than what your exempt purpose is. So if you have an exempt purpose of providing scholarships, let's say, um, providing the scholarship isn't going to be private enormous. That's what you're set up to do. But if, you're, if, a, if an insider, like a manager or a board member, is receiving financial benefit through the organization, that's going to be termed private enormous. And that's what, I'm, that's what I've just been talking about. Private enormous is an absolute term. There's no de minimis, no de minimis exception. And the authority for it is actually in the IRS code where you have uh, the authorization for charitable organizations in the first place. And it says no part of the net earnings of the exempt organization inures or flows to the benefit of any private shareholder or individual. And so that's the whole basis of setting up a nonprofit uh, entity, and if you don't follow that, the IRS is going to say you that you're engaging in private enormous. Now, the other part of this is private benefit, and there's a difference between two of these, and bet between the two of these. So, private enormous focuses on the insiders, but private benefit can be conferred on people outside of your organization. So, if you're providing a benefits of some kind of, uh, of a financial type to somebody outside of your organization, a disinterested third party, then that may trigger this whole problem with the IRS. Now the difference between the private benefit and private enormous is that the private benefit does have what they call a de minimis exception. So you can give a minor private benefit to the outsider and not trigger IRS action. And unfortunately, and this drives people crazy, it's, there's no bright line. So you kind of have to just sort of be in tune with the idea that if you're giving an outsider a private benefit that's sort of separate from your exempt purpose, that you could be straying into dangerous territory and that's when you want to get a professional involved to make sure that you're not doing something improper. The third way that you can lose your tax exempt status is improper lobbying. A lot of folks are kind of surprised to find out that, pro that nonprofit organizations can lobby, and I'm talking about political lobbying here. But the, but the truth is, they can subject to certain restrictions. So the federal law allows public charities to lobby so long as they don't devote 
what's called a substantial part of their activities to attempting to influence legislation. And I'm going to come back to this slide. Uh, it will make more sense after we talk about the definition of lobbying. We'll come back to that grid. So to understand um, what lobbying is, you just look at this definition. It's kind of broad, but it's the attempt to influence the passage, defeat, introduction, or amendment of legislation, including bills introduced by a state, federal, or local legislative body, your town council, your city hall, state legislature, bond issues, referenda, constitutional amendments, and Senate confirmation votes on executive branch nominees. It's pretty much any attempt to influence the um, political process in terms of legislation. Now, we have to further divide this between direct lobbying and grassroots lobbying because it makes a difference for how much you can spend on your lobbying activities. So direct lobbying is any attempt to influence any legislation through communication with a legislator, an employee of a legislative body, or other government official. So we're talking about your state legislator or Congress. And that communication refers to specific legislation and reflects a view on that legislation. That's direct lobbying. Grassroots lobbying is a little bit more complicated. It's basically any attempt to uh, uh, affect public opinion in general, but the definition is more complicated. So any attempt to influence legislation through an attempt to affect the opinions of the general public, um, the communication that constitutes grassroots lobbying refers to specific legislation, it reflects a view on that legislation, and it encourages the person who's hearing that communication to take action in one of four ways by directly urging them to contact legislators or other government officials in order to influence legislation, by including the contact information of a legislator or government official, providing a petition or postcard or other prepared message to send to a government official or legislator that's designed to influence the legislation, or by identifying one or more legislators who will vote on the legislation as opposing your view being undecided, being uh, the, the person who hears the message, their representative in the legislature, or being a member of the committee that will consider the legislation. And just a disclaimer, encouraging someone to take action doesn't include naming the name, main sponsors of legislation. So that's grassroots lobbying. And the reason why the difference is important, and I'm going to go back to that previous slide here, is that how much you can spend on your lobbying activities and therefore how, whether you're in line with the law on your lobbying activities depends on whether you're doing grassroots lobbying or um, direct lobbying. So this is what's called the 501H expenditures test. There is also another test called the substantial part test, basically. And that says if your lobbying activities don't constitute a substantial part of your overall activities, that'll be fine. You can do that. It's a little bit vague, and it causes all sorts of problems. Almost no organization tries to follow that test anymore. And Congress, after years of problems with it, said, you know, we're going to give you a specific grid that you can follow. So they enacted what's called the expenditures test. And now everybody, almost, almost everybody follows that just because it's so easy. And the information you have to include on your tax return is a lot simpler if you follow this. So, for example, if you have annual uh, expenditures and furtherance of your act exempt purposes of 500000 or less, then 20% of that can be spent on lobbying. And that's a hard and fast rule. And so you can see as you go down this grid, uh, the different numbers... Uh, of expenditures and then how what the percentage of that that can be spent on lobbying is and I won't belabor that the point to remember is that at the bottom the cap is a million dollars so you're not supposed to spend more than a million dollars on lobbying activities in total every year and then grassroots lobbying expenditures can never be more than 25 percent of an organization's total allowable lobbying ceiling so you can spend more on direct lobbying than you can on grassroots lobbying, but if you go outside of those guidelines on any, either one of those, then you're going to be in territory again that you're going to run the risk of having your exempt status revoked for improper lobbying. Now, 
The other thing to remember is if, you're, if your organization is going to try to influence the political process through lobbying, there are all sorts of lobbying registration and requirements. And again, this is why you want to have a professional that's licensed in your jurisdiction if you're going to be doing that because there are federal requirements and there are state requirements depending on where you're going to be lobbying. Um, if you're in the, if you're going to be lobbying, for example, the federal government, you have to register. If you're going to be lobbying a member of Congress, you have to register with the clerk of the House of Representatives. Then you have to register with the Secretary of the Senate. In Michigan, where I practice, if you're going to be lobbying the state legislature, you have to register with the Michigan Department of State and comply with the Election Bureau law. So there are all sorts of things. And then they have all kinds of requirements that you have to do. Uh, reporting requirements. So there, it's a big deal if you're going to try to get into that and you would definitely want professional help. One thing to say about private foundations, I don't know how many folks from private foundations are here, but um, the private foundations are essentially prohibited from lobbying. There's the tax burden on them, the excise taxes that the IRS puts on private foundations for lobbying. It's just so great that it basically amounts to a prohibition against it. Um, but your 501c3 charitable organizations, public charities, can do it within those parameters that we've just discussed. So a close cousin of lobbying is political campaign activity. And this is a completely different matter. 501c3 organizations are expressly prohibited from intervening in political campaigns for any candidate for public office or from engaging in any partisan activity. That's, a, that's an absolute prohibition, and it's pretty strongly enforced. However, you may have noticed during various political campaign seasons, and I always notice this, um, there are churches or religious organizations that seem to get very involved in the campaign process. And this is especially true, and I'm not throwing stones at anybody, but this is especially true in like the evangelical uh, church world. A lot of involvement trying to rally support for certain candidates and issues. And, I've, and people, you hear this in every campaign season, if you turn on CNN or wherever, you know, why are these folks allowed to enter the political process? They're a nonprofit organization. And there's kind of, a, kind of a, an exception that they work under, which is voter education. So if you are doing voter education, you're allowed to engage in the pol political process in that way. You can also educate the uh, government officials, but it's a fine line. And every year there is a big squawk among people who object to another organization's activities uh, during the political season. Complaints get filed, you know, people try to get organizations disqualified. And so again, it's just another case where there's, there's supposed to be a bright line, but then it turns gray in the administration of things. So, Technically, if you're, if you're going to engage in voter education, then that may be a way that you can get involved in the political campaign area, but you have to be very careful. You wouldn't want to try to do that without um, expert help because if you cross that line, um, you're going to get hammered pretty bad. One thing I hear often is, well, Mike, you know, we have the First Amendment. How can the government keep, me from, keep my organization from expressing its opinion on political topics that's un-American? Well, the courts don't agree. The courts have said that tax exempt status is a privilege, not a right, and that it is not unconstitutional uh, to impose conditions on exempt organizations to achieve their status. And one of those is political, a pol political campaign prohibition. And so that's just an example of a case of a, a branch ministries who sued to be able to engage in political campaign activity and still keep their nonprofit status. And uh, the court in Washington, D.C., not the Supreme Court, but a circuit court, uh, court of appeal, said that, no, this is permissible, and uh, you're going to have to work around it. Now, the fifth thing um, that we're going to talk about is um, what's called accumulating excess business or excess unrelated business income. So uh, a lot of folks, understandably, um, are under the impression that nonprofits can't make a profit. And that's not technically true because all a profit is is retaining net earnings after you have paid all of your expenses. Whatever is left over is technically a profit. And there are a lot of nonprofits that are actually very profitable. 
And if you have that problem, it's a good problem to have, but you are actually earning a profit, and now you're straying into an area that can cause you to lose your uh, exemption if you're not careful and it's not handled correctly. Accumulating excess unrelated business income. So let's give an example of what I'm talking about. Um, and I can't claim that this example originated from me. I took it off the internet, but I thought it was a good example. Uh, let's say you have the Friends of the Public Library. And it's a 501c3 organization. It's set up to encourage education, love of literature, and support for the local library. And let's say that they have a lecture series and they have a volunteer book drive where, where their members come and donate books and then they sell the books and the money from the lecture series and that book sale, the volunteer book sale, goes to support the Friends of the Public Library. That's all directly related to their exempt purpose. It's furthering their exempt purpose. They can earn all the money they want from that and it's not going to get taxed. That's related business income. And um, have at it and take, you know, hopefully you can get as much as you can from that sort of activity and further your exempt purpose. What you can't do with that money, if you have money left over, is you can't distribute it to your board of directors or your uh, executives or your workers, like bonuses, stuff like that. Um, that's, that would be private inurement that we talked about, or a private benefit if you give it to somebody outside of the organization. But as long as you're using that net income to further your exempt purpose in a legitimate way, the IRS doesn't care and it's not going to tax you on that. What would be unrelated business income in our example is if after the book sale is over you have a bunch of books that are left over and you say, okay, let's try to get rid of these books. You put, maybe you put an ad on Craigslist and you get a tremendous response. Maybe you have some rare books and pretty soon You've got people coming to you to buy and sell rare books and you're making a tremendous amount of money. Um, that's unrelated business income because that's not really related to your promotion of literature. I mean, directly related. It's not promotion to, it's not related to your promotion of the library or love of the library. And the IRS is going to consider that as unrelated business income. It's not illegal to do that. A lot of charities support their activities through um, unrelated business activities, industries, things like that. But if you have that situation, you have to be aware that if you have excess unrelated business income, you're going to get into the target sites of the IRS for um, accumulating too much of it. So income, what I'm talking about then is income from a regular trade or business that is not substantially related to the charitable, educational, or other purpose that is the basis for your tax exemption. So you have to be, um, again, it's not illegal to have that income, but you have to be careful how much you accumulate. And it's, a, it's not a bright line, so there's some gray areas here, but essentially what happens is you want to be careful about when you, get into the, when, the, when you get into the territory of your unrelated business income matching or exceeding your income that you get from your regular nonprofit activities, that's when you're starting to get into danger of um, accumulating excess income. Um, so if you, for example, in our example, if they have this book sale that starts to go big and they have to hire extra staff, uh, you know, they start taking a lot of time away from the normal charitable activities that they were set up to do to run this book business. Um, the book business starts bringing in more money than the regular charity itself does. They're starting to get into the territory of accumulating excess unrelated business income and they need to be very careful about how they proceed from there on out. And that would be an area that you definitely want to get a local accountant who specializes in this area to help you with because the consequences can be devastating if you, if you uh, cross the line on that. So then the next thing, again, is kind of a close cousin to the accumulating excess business income, and that is going to be not paying taxes on your unrelated business income. So again, uh, you've got two things to worry about. If you get too much of that income, you're going to possibly get into trouble. But even if you don't have too much of that income, you still have to pay taxes on it because it's not charitable income. So there's a whole process that you have to go through just like a regular business would have to go through to pay taxes on that. And to comply with that, you have to determine, there are a few steps, you have to determine if you have unrelated trade or business, you have to kind of decide if what you're being, what activity you're engaging in really 
uh, relates to your charitable purpose. If you think it does not relate, then you have to calculate the income and deductions from that unrelated trade or business, just like you would if you were running a regular business. And then you have to prepare and file your tax return for unrelated business income. And it's called a Form 990-T. And it's separate and in addition to the 990 form that we talked about in the beginning. This is a different form that has to be filed. And then the kicker is you have to pay your estimated taxes just like a regular business would. And you have to pay those on a quarterly basis. And I think, the, uh, I think it's if you have more than $1,000 of uh, unrelated business income. The first thousand dollars is free and then if you go above that you have to start the process that we just talked about. Now this is a really good IRS publication if you think you're in this, uh, in this area. Publication 598 and you can Google it and I've actually done this. You just type in in Google IRS publication 598 and it will, it's a PDF document and it has lots of good information on how to pay your taxes for unrelated business income if you're having that situation. The other way that you can get more information on this is by contacting the IRS Exempt Organizations Division directly. And they have, there's, there's the web address, irs.gov slash EO for exempt organizations. And then there's an 800 number, and again, I can get that to you afterwards if you want. And believe it or not, um, the IRS in addition to its enforcement ramp up, is also trying to be more customer friendly. And I've actually called these numbers, or I've called this number and another number for a different matter. And they're, they're very helpful, they're very friendly, and they, you know, they're, they're, your call is recorded for customer service purposes. And so they can be very helpful. So if you have questions, don't hesitate to get in touch with the folks at these um, contact points because they can be very helpful in resolving or giving you more information, pointing you in the right direction. So again, you gotta file your form 990-T, which is separate than your regular form. You can get an extension, and here's the $1,000 that I talked about. Uh, if you have more than $1,000 of gross income from unrelated Ugh. business, uh, you have to file that form. Um, there it is, you have to file it in addition to filing your regular one. Um, I'm gonna see the extension bullet point in a second, but just a bit of trivia, it's filed with a certain service center in Utah, and it's gotta be filed after the uh, fifth month, after the end of your organization's taxable year. There's a particular place they want you to file it, and if, you've, if your due date falls on a non-business day, it's due on the next business day. Um, you can, the, here's where I was trying to get to, was your, you can request an automatic six-month extension, just like you can in other tax scenarios like your personal taxes or your, or your corporate tax, you can get a six month extension by filing a certain form, Form 8868. So that's the last thing to remember. That's the most important thing to remember is pay your estimated taxes. That's a great way to get into trouble if you have unrelated business income and you're not paying your quarterly estimated taxes. Um, if you have income that exceeds $500, if that's what you expect, more than $500, then you have to go ahead and pay your quarterly estimated taxes. In addition to your federal obligations, you need to um, find out if you have any state law obligations for your taxes if you have unrelated business income. And I just use this as an example. Um, I'm from Michigan, so in Michigan we had the Michigan business tax went into effect a few years ago, and it has a filing threshold that's different from the federal threshold. So you just want to make sure that you're covering both of those bases, and that's why, again, I say it's important to get a local professional involved who will be able to advise you about your state um, requirements. So number seven, faulty corporate, uh, faulty corporate financial record keeping can be a killer. And if you uh, have bad record keeping, ultimately it can lead to having your tax exempt status revoked. So this is kind of state law, but it's probably similar throughout pretty much every state in America. Um, I took this from Michigan law, but again, I think it's, it's going to be, um, as a general rule, going to be true wherever you are. Corporations and most nonprofit 501c3 organizations are corporations. So corporations are required to maintain three types of books and records. Books of account, shareholder records, 
or membership records, and minutes of shareholder or director proceedings, board of director proceedings. Those are the three major categories of information that a corporation needs to maintain. Now, there are different requirements about how long different sorts of documents have to be maintained. And some records only have to be maintained a certain period of time. Other records have to be maintained longer. But in the context of a nonprofit, there are certain records that should be maintained indefinitely. So these would be your articles of incorporation, your determination letter from the IRS, which is what tells you that you are a tax-exempt organization. Insurance policies should be maintained indefinitely. Uh, minutes of your meetings, you know, like your board of directors meetings or committee meetings should be maintained indefinitely. Corporate resolutions should be maintained indefinitely. In Michigan, again, I'm going to use Michigan as an example. It might be the same in your state. It might be different. Michigan requires nonprofit records to be maintained, like articles of incorporation, minutes, uh, and consents of incorporators when you're talking about initial business connected with incorporating the business, like selecting your board, adopting bylaws. Your bylaws have to be maintained, and uh, board of directors' actions uh, have to be uh, reflected in minutes or consents. Um, information regarding your nonprofit corporation's registered agent, which is just your representative before the state. It doesn't have to be like a legal professional, but anybody who is on record as getting notices from the state. Appropriate documents reflecting the kind of nonprofit that you are, like whether you're a membership organization, whether you're a board of directors organization. Uh, documents regarding organization meetings, again, minutes, consents, notices, all of those good things have to be maintained. And in Michigan, you're required that a, a, the, to maintain certain financial records. Like in Michigan, if a member of a nonprofit requests a balance sheet, it has to be mailed to them when they request it. Um, and then, of course, business records like contracts, loans, guarantees sales of your assets. Michigan requires you to maintain those kinds of records as well. Again, it might be different in your jurisdiction or it might be the same. You'd be surprised at how similar some of these uh, requirements are across different state lines. Tax records have to be maintained. Uh, as I said before, Form 990 is a public document, so there are all kinds of requirements associated with how you have to produce it depending on how the request is made. We won't get into that today. Um, that could be a seminar in and of itself, but you just need to know that you got to maintain your Form 990s because you have to turn them over to a member of the public if they're requested. Um, one thing that I'll say is, uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. It's, uh, it's kind of a common act. Um, it was passed in response to the corporate scandals of the late 1990s and 2000, early 2000s, Enron, WorldCom, those types of companies. So um, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act is designed to combat corporate fraud. Most of its provisions apply to um, publicly held companies. But some of the provisions apply to any kind of corporate entity, a private entity, a public entity, a nonprofit entity. One of the things that applies to even nonprofits, the smallest nonprofit, this big federal law, is that you cannot destroy a document that is the subject of a proceeding or investigation. That's what happened in Enron. They were shredding just massive amounts of documents when they heard there was an investigation into their company trying to destroy all the evidence. So now they've created, the federal government created a law that said you can't do that. Well, you often don't know if your organization is the subject of an investigation because the government doesn't always tell you. Um, it doesn't always seem fair that you might have to keep track of a document that you don't even know you're being investigated about, but that essentially is what happens. So how you can combat this is by having a document retention policy. And there are sample policies. In fact, I brought one. I, um, this is what did, I had two things, my outline and my sample document retention policy. The document retention policy made it, so I'll be happy to give you a copy of that if you'd like it. Um, it's from the American, it's like an American Institute of Accountants or something. We'll see it on the screen. But it's very important that even the smallest nonprofit have some sort of document retention policy and that it's implemented, that everybody's educated about it, and that it's followed. Because if you are investigated and it comes out that you destroyed a document, 
even if you didn't know you were being investigated, but the timing of it looks suspicious to a third person in the government or a third party, you know, there, there, a claim could be made that you did know and that you destroyed it to avoid the investigation or liability. So if you have a document retention policy and you can say, no, we were just following our normal policy, here it is in writing, here's how we do it, you have a much better chance of escaping that sort of allegation. So developing a document retention policy involves a couple of steps, or a few steps actually. So you want to identify what kind of paperwork that your nonprofit generates. Every nonprofit generates a different level of paperwork, different kind of paperwork. So you want to figure out and get, get a handle on what kind of paperwork you are generating. And then you want to determine the appropriate and legal length of time that you have to retain those papers. Again, you have federal rules, you have state rules, and you're going to have to go through for each kind of paperwork that you're generating, figure out what those are. That's where a, a local professional can help you. And then you want to record those retention times on a calendar. And you want to have that calendar ironclad and followed so that you a uh, written schedule or a calendar. Um, and that's how you, in general terms, that's how you record uh, or, or retain documents and um, develop a policy that will help you avoid the allegation that you have faulty record keeping or worse that you're trying to destroy something that you shouldn't have. So I have up here, I have a handout. It's the sample document retention policy that was created by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. And I can pass that out afterward. But the thing to remember about this or any other sample document that you get is that it, it, you can't, you shouldn't just adopt it wholeheartedly without making any changes and say, well, here's my policy. I got a sample. It was prepared by an accountant. I, you know, it needs to be customized to your organization and what you're doing. I know that in my own practice, one of, uh, in my old office, uh, we had a client who came in, was having all sorts of problems, and we said, where is your document retention policy? And the guy said, oh, yeah, I know. We have one of those. Yeah, it's up here on the shelf here somewhere. It's back in one of these binders. We had it prepared. It's, I'll find it here somewhere. And we all just, the lawyers just kind of looked at each other. And, you know, that's not a policy that's going to work. If you have a policy that you then just put into a binder and put it up on a shelf, you don't have a policy. It's the same as not having a policy because you're not using it. So you want to have a policy that's crafted specifically for you, and then you want to use it, not just put it up on the shelf and um, forget about it. So we've already talked about the laws and rules that govern document retention policies, generally speaking. It's an important area. Um, it just takes one disgruntled employee or volunteer to make an allegation, and then you can trip on a banana peel by destroying a document that you shouldn't have. Even if it's innocent, it can look bad, and then you're in the soup, as they say. The next one that we're going to talk about, and we're getting to the end soon, mismanaging funds. Um, you, that, that seems very basic, and it is basic. It's kind of as, as basic as filing your tax return, but you, again, would be surprised at how many people get tripped up on this. And I'm going to give you an example of how this can happen, even when you're trying to do the right thing. So my example is a soup kitchen. And again, I didn't originate this. I got this from some website. I thought it was a good example. But let's say you have a soup kitchen. And the soup kitchen has a building fund. And they're a couple years away from actually breaking ground. But they're getting donations and contributions in for their building. And let's say it's uh, approaching the holiday season. Let's say they have an annual Christmas dinner for the homeless. They've got a lot of money in their building fund. They've got no money in their annual dinner for the homeless fund. So the director says, look, we got a lot of money in our building fund. Let's just shift some of that over so we can cover our annual dinner for the homeless and we'll be good to go. And that's what they do. And so the question is, did they mismanage their funds? Did they possibly commit a crime? And the answer is maybe. They may not have, but they may have. And this is this is why I'm bringing this up, because it's an example of somebody who's not trying to be shady or devious, but just may have violated a technical rule. So I put up here solicited designations and unsolicited designations. If you have a campaign like a building fund, and you send out letters and say, please donate to our building fund, and somebody sends in a check, a donation for that, 
you have to use that contribution for the thing that you solicited it for. So you can't just switch out funds from your building fund if you made specific uh, appeals for that building fund. People are relying on that when they're contributing their funds. You have a legal obligation to use that money for the building fund. That's a solicited designation. Now, this is kind of surprising. A lot of people are surprised about this. An unsolicited designation is where somebody sends in a contribution and writes a note and says, I'd like this money used for the building fund. And the question is, do you have to use that for the building fund? And surprisingly, technically, you don't because it is an unsolicited designation. You didn't ask them to contribute to the building fund. They just wrote it in unsolicited and designated those funds for the building fund. Technically, you're allowed to use those funds for your annual dinner for the homeless. Now, you've complied with the legal requirements, but you're, you could have a PR problem at that point because if your donors hear that you're using the funds that they sent in for the building fund for your annual dinner for the homeless, you could have a little bit of an issue. You could have people upset at you. So while you're legally entitled to do that, you may not want to do that without going, if you're in a jam, you might want to go to the person and you know, ask them, is it okay if I use your contribution? We're running short on the homeless uh, dinner fund this year. That's one way you can handle it. But this is an example of how somebody with a good intent wanting to do a program that's perfectly uh, laudable but switches money around in a way that's not allowed. And um, you know, if, if that's brought to the IRS's attention, you could be in a situation where they believe you're mismanaging your funds, not behaving appropriately in the administration of your tax-exempt organization, and you could have a problem with your tax-exempt status. So that's something to be very careful about. Yes? So you, you said that with the unsolicited that you could just be on the safe side, go and ask somebody, could we use this donation for this. Can you do that for solicited also? Sure, you can. You can. As long as the person gives you permission, that's what you're looking for. But if, if you have a solicited um, fund and you go to that person and you say, can we switch over your, des uh, your designation? And they say, no, you've got you've to abide by it. That's the thing to remember on that. Okay, so the t ninth reason uh, let's see, well, how are we doing in terms of time? Well, we're doing pretty good. Okay. The ninth reason is providing support to bad people or organizations. And again, whenever I bring this up, people often say to me, duh. You know, what are we talking about? Well, I'm talking about terrorism, to be very blunt. People say, Mike, I would never support terrorism. That's crazy, especially in an Adventist setting. It's easier than you might think to kind of get uh, across the line here, and I'm going to explain how that is. So you have two, time, two kinds of terrorism, domestic terrorism and foreign terrorism. So I put up a little uh, definition of domestic terrorism, which is the unlawful use of force or violence committed by a group or groups of two or more individuals against persons or property to intimidate or coerce a government, the civilian population, or any segment thereof in furtherance of a political of political or social objectives. That's kind of the overall definition of domestic terrorism that I found. Um, we've all heard of the Patriot Act. Uh, we all know that uh, we've heard of the NSA surveillance program. You know, there's a real renewed emphasis on surveillance and combating terrorism as a result of the uh, stage of history that we're in. So the US a Patriot Act, um, has a definition of domestic terrorism as well, which is basically kind of what I put in my uh, definition that I had a, uh, in the previous slide. It involves acts dangerous to human life that are a violation of criminal laws of the United States or any state, and that they appear to be intended to intimidate, coerce, et cetera, influence policy, intimidation, uh, affect the conduct of a government by mass destruction, assassination, kidnapping, that occur within the territorial jurisdiction of the United States. Um, federal agencies maintain terrorism watch lists. So, for example, the FBI has a domestic terrorist watch list. And I'm going to sort of tie this together here in a moment about how you can stumble into this. The FBI has a terrorist watch list. It's a secret list as far as uh, 
folks estimate that there are about a half a million entries on the list. No one's really entirely sure who all is on the list, but approximately half a million people. Some examples of the designated terrorist groups. They will, the authorities do designate terrorist groups. So Earth Liberation Front, it's an eco-terrorist group. Animal, Animal Liberation Front, this is gonna be part of my example in a second, so I'll bring these folks back into it. But Animal Liberation Front, which is an animal rights group. Uh, the Jewish Defense League is a terrorist group. Ku Klux Klan, Aryan Nations, Black Liberation Army. This is the kind of, kind of uh, examples that we have of domestic terrorist groups that have been designated by the federal government as um, domestic terrorists. So in addition to that, of course, we have the US Department of State that lists foreign terrorist organizations. Uh, so I picked out a few that might sound familiar, Hamas, Al-Qaeda, we've all heard of that. ETA, which is a Basque separatist group in Spain. Um, Shining Path, I don't even know if Shining Path exists anymore. I think I read in the paper that they're pretty much kaput down in Peru or Bolivia, but maybe, who knows, I don't know. Maybe they're still active. But that's one that you may remember from news stories a long time ago, Shining Path. And here's why it matters with terrorist groups. And I'm gonna give you a case from 2002 PETA. Have we all heard of PETA, the, the animal rights group? In 2002, PETA gave a $1,500, and I'm not here to defend PETA or, or knock them. This is they're just a good example of what can happen. PETA, because um, I know it's a controversial uh, group, uh, to say the least. PETA gave a $1,500 contribution to the, let me back up here, it was the, I can't remember, it was the Animal, I think it was the Animal Liberation Front. It's either the Earth Liberation Front or the Animal Liberation Front. I think it was the Animal Liberation Front. They gave a $1,500 contribution. And in their report to the IRS, they said it was, the contribution was for program activities. And that's what they listed all of their contributions as being for program activities, not terribly helpful. So somebody got, somebody pulled the 990, watch dog groups that don't like PETA, pulled the 990, and saw that they made a donation of $1,500 to the Animal Liberation Front. Well, the Animal Liberation Front is a designated terrorist organization, blowing things up, eco-terrorism, uh, that sort of thing. And so somebody filed a complaint with the federal government saying PETA donated $1,500 to the Animal Liberation Front. It should have its tax-exempt status revoked. So there were hearings, there was a lot of press on it, a lot of bad press, because PETA did something kind of dumb. They gave inconsistent reasons for why they gave this donation. I think the first reason was, um, I don't even remember the first reason, but they had like four opportunities to explain this. So their spokesman gave reason X. The next day, somebody appeared on CNN and gave a different reason. Two weeks later, the president of the organization said it was for a not something else. And so it just kind of piqued everybody's interest. What was this $1,500 for? And uh, the drumbeat started getting louder. We want PETA's tax exempt status revoked. And it was headed by you know, business groups that uh, oppose their, their agenda. And some other groups like Chamber of Commerce, I think, was in on it. And so eventually, what the, the explanation that they settled on was that they gave the $1,500 to pay legal fees for a member of the Animal Liberation Front that had been charged with a crime in connection with the terrorist uh, activity that they had been accused of. So that's kind of how PETA got out of um, the soup is because they said, well, we weren't contributing to the terrorist organization. We were contributing to paying somebody's legal fees and what's more American than that, paying somebody's legal fees when they're accused of a crime. And so it kind of died down and, and it kind of went away but it was kind of a, a good example of what can happen if you're not careful about who you're giving your money to or who you're associating with. And as an example, I mean, in the ASI family, you have organizations that have an international component. A lot of, a lot of our brothers and sisters here work on, on, on international projects, humanitarian projects. You have to be very careful about who you're, who you're financially linked with because I know, for example, in the Middle East, there are designated terrorist groups, at least that are designated by the U US government, who also provide clinics, who build schools, who do health care, who do all sorts of charitable activities. And if you get mixed up financially with some of these organizations, 
I think Hamas is an organization that conducts those sorts of activities. Um, you can then have an issue of whether you have contributed funds or financial resources to a terrorist group. And so it can, it can be very easy, uh, if you don't check out who you're dealing with, to make a contribution, even a small one like $1,500, have somebody pull your 990 if they're hostile to what you're trying to accomplish, and boom, you've got an, an accusation that you have um, funded terrorism. And in this environment that we're in, it's not something that you want to have to face. And people have real hair triggers, no pun intended. People are very concerned about terrorism. They don't want people funding terrorism. And so it's very easy, especially in an organization like ASI, the members here, where there's the international component and you may have, you, you may not know necessarily all the background of the people that you're dealing with. You want to be very careful and check people out because it doesn't take much to be accused in today's day and age of supporting terrorism. And um, that's why I included that on the list. And that's a really great way in today's environment for a fast track uh, revocation of your tax exempt status. So the final reason that I'm going to give you, and this is kind of a boring reason, but we'll finish up with it. It's uh, kind of humdrum. It's not dissolving or closing out your nonprofit organization correctly. And you might think that when you're done with your nonprofit organization, you don't have anything to do. You just shut your doors and you're done. You don't have to worry about anything else. But it's not true, because if you don't shut it down correctly, the IRS could assess penalties, excise taxes, income taxes. So you want to make sure that when you're done, that you're really done and you shut it down correctly. So you make your decision to dissolve. You have to comply with IRS oversight. Typically what you do, I'm just going to give you a general overview of this. You have to fill out your final Form 990. You have to check certain information. You have to support. You have to provide supporting documents with that final tax return that the IRS recover, uh, requires, and you have to make sure that it's done correctly. Otherwise, you could trigger action by the IRS that costs you money. And the IRS has published a fact sheet. It's publication 4779. And again, if you just Google IRS publication 4779, it's a. It's I think it's four or five pages. PDF document online um, that gives you the requirements that you have to go through to wind up your, your IRS uh, tax exempt organization in an appropriate way. Now, I'm going to give an example from Michigan, and it may be different in different states, but you're not done when you're done with the IRS. You have to get your state approval to wind down your tax exempt organization, your nonprofit. So in Michigan, you have to apply to the Michigan Attorney General for a permission. Get approval to wind down your organization. They almost never deny it, but you still have to get it. And you have to submit a, a disillusion questionnaire with required attachments. And you can find that, at least for the Michigan Attorney General, on its website. Um, and again, in Michigan, you have to file a corporate disillusion certificate. Um, and you then have to file that document with your Michigan Attorney General's approval letter with the Michigan Department of Licensing, the Corporation Division. Um, you also have to get a tax clearance from the Michigan Department of Treasury. And so you can see that there are a number of steps on the state level. Um, it's actually it can be a little more complicated on the state level to do this than it is on the federal level, at least in Michigan. It may be different in your state. And that's when you, when, if you go to shut down your nonprofit, you want to have an accountant help you with that or a tax attorney that's licensed in your state because you don't want to mess this up because it's not as serious as some of the other things that we've talked about, but it's going to cost you money if you don't do it correctly. And who wants to pay money when you're done with your exempt organization? And that's the end. I think we're pretty close to being done on time. Here. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to. We're pretty much, I think it's a, a quarter till, so I'm happy to answer questions if you need to go. Uh, no offense taken. About uh, private endearment? Or yes. Uh, how do you determine what is reasonable compensation to reward that? Great, OK. So the question was, for private endearment, how do you determine what is reasonable compensation? If I had the answer to that, it's a, it's not a, it's there's no bright line. It's um it's there's a, it's basically what they call a fact and circumstances test. 
Um, and that's why you've got to work with a, a professional on that because the IRS knows it when it sees it. I mean, there are certain obvious cases. If you run like a little animal shelter and you're paying yourself a million dollars a year, pretty good chance that you're going to be deemed to have uh, unreasonable compensation. So it's, it can be difficult. That's why you want to... What about officer loans? Uh, what are the restrictions on Well, again, there are, there are you ha not necessarily bright line restrictions necessarily. You, there are just broad guidelines that are way beyond the scope of this seminar here. But you, you can do the, the, the takeaways, you can do them, but you just have to be very careful in terms of like the repayment terms, the interest rate. For, I'll give you an example. Uh, he, I'm sorry, the question was about loans to, to executives. or So what, what are the guidelines for making loans to officers of your organization? So like for example, if you were to give an interest-free loan that may be a problem. It might not be, but you're starting, you know, if you, the more of a sweetheart deal you give, the more you're getting into the territory where it may be inappropriate. And it does depend on your facts, particular facts and circumstances. So I can't tell you, well, always do this and you'll be okay. It, it just depends. And that's why you want to work with somebody who's licensed in your jurisdiction because there's some state law aspects to this as well as federal law aspects to it. So you want to, you want to have somebody who's licensed where you live and work who can educate you on that. Going back to uh, accumulating excess unrelated business income, um, what about our fundraising thing or, or primary business or company is, for example, medical and dental outreach to underprivileged, underprivileged communities? Yep. Right. Um, how is that, that still considered? Well, okay, that's, that can, that's a good question. So your, your primary business is? Medical, taking teams of doctors, nurses, uh, dentists to underprivileged countries, for example. Okay. And is your concert, is your concert run by volunteers? Okay. So you might be able to, and again, this is again, you know, a facts and circumstances type thing. But depending on how it's administered, you might be able to say that your concert is part of your exempt activity to raise funds. But anytime you have an activity like that where it's not really um, right in line necessarily with your exempt purpose, that's where you've got to be careful about um, accumulating income from that activity. And that's the kind of thing where, where you've spotted an issue and you would want to take all the facts to an advisor in your local jurisdiction to, to make sure that you're in compliance. Because all of the funds actually get used in the, in the mission. Yeah. Well, yeah, but it also depends on whether it is an activity that they're generated. It's not just how they're used, it's how they're generated. So if, if they're generated by an activity that is not um, in furtherance of your primary mission, even if the funds are used to further your primary it's the way it's generated, so you could still get into trouble. Yeah. I have a related question to his, and that is, if, if, if you mentioned the threshold that gets to 50% or more matching funds of your normal activities versus this activity, is there a, a low threshold that won't attract the interest that will get and say, you know what, that's, that's so minor, 10%, 5%? I don't know if there's a specific threshold like that. It's just, it's more, again, as you trend upwards and, and you get to the point where your unrelated business activity is starting to generate money that is equal to, as you start approaching uh, amounts that are equal to your primary purpose activities that generate funds, and even then if you're approaching, it's not necessarily a problem. You just want to be aware that as you trend upwards, you're getting into the territory where it could be scrutinized and determined to be unrelated, you know, excess. And again, it's, it, it's even the, even, and I didn't mean to give the impression that there's a hard and fast rule of 50% or 100%. It, you take all the circumstances and you look at everything in totality, and then you kind of make the judgment call of whether this is going to be determined to be excess business or unrelated business income. 
Um, but the general rule is the more that is in proportion to your regular activities income, the better chance you have of being deemed to have gone kind of off the reservation. So you want to, um, if you're, if you're generate, the general rule is, you know, if, you, if you're devoting staff to that unrelated business activity, if it's generating a significant amount in comparison to what your normal activity does, um, you, you need to look at that and make sure that you're not out of whack in terms of proportion. And again, that's where an accountant who does nonprofit work would be really helpful to, to guide you because that's a dynamic thing. The, what the IRS does today may be a little bit different from what it does tomorrow. So you, know, you want to get with somebody who has the current knowledge about what the agents are looking for at, on that, in that area. Yep. Oh, well. Okay, so the question is, what is the difference between a foundation and a trust? So um, a, a foundation could actually be a trust. And so this is a real complicated area that probably is a little bit outside of what we were talking about today. But you have a number of different options when you set up a nonprofit organization. You can make it, um, you can be like a corporation, you can be a trust. Um, a foundation could probably be a corporation or a trust. I mean, it just a lot of it is like categorization for tax purposes. And so um, that's, I tell you what, there are books that are thick that are written on just that subject, on which one to choose and what the characteristics are. And so it's not something I can just answer real briefly. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I hope... It was helpful. Okay.